Mary, co-laboring with Angel. We're continuing our study in Paul's first epistle to the Thessalonians. Our text today is 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 to 20. It's produced for you in the bulletin, as is an outline that I'm sure will help you follow along with my remarks. This is God's word. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. But you brothers became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea, for you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out and displeased God and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them at last. But since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face because we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before the Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. We have a can opener in our kitchen at home. I cannot seem to work. It's not like the old school kind, you know, where you press down and you turn, 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 and the lid all, you know, all of a sudden pops up. This one you kind of put to the side. Like, I don't know how it works. And if Janice isn't there, I starve. At Calvary, we believe the Word of God is powerful to open up human hearts. But how does it work? This text answers that question for us. Notice what's going on. Paul is giving thanks to God, reminding his readers in these verses that their faith is the product of the Word of God. Paul came preaching, and something supernatural happened in their hearts so that when Paul began explaining from the Old Testament that Jesus Christ had to suffer and be raised from the dead, the Spirit of God created in their hearts a supernatural ability to believe that, to trust that, and to make that Jesus their own. So Paul decidedly credits their salvation to the working of the Word of God, the very Word of God. I love this phrase that we read. He says, the Word of God which is at work in you believers. You might hear echoes in that phrase of the text we read earlier from Isaiah 55. God says, God promises this, so will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and for, without succeeding in the manner for which I sent it. Maybe that's what Paul has in his mind. So let's ask these three questions. What exactly does the Word of God do according to the text? Paul shows it performs at least three things. It provokes the proud, it predicts hostility, and it produces treasures of grace. Number one, how does the Word of God work? What can we expect it to do? It provokes the proud. Notice the sad situation Paul compares the believers in Thessalonica to the believers who first believed in Jesus in Judea. 
They both experience persecution by their own fellow countrymen, the Jews. Verse 14, you brothers became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea, for you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews. Paul is alluding to the struggle he had wherever he went. Most of the opposition to his gospel preaching came from his own countrymen, the Jews. And most commentators believe that when Paul annexes the Jews, he's really referring to the Jewish leaders, not sort of the people in their massive. Does Paul sound like an anti-Semitic? He is not. He himself is Jewish. He loved his countrymen so much so that Paul wrote in Romans chapter 9, seeing how so many of the Jews were not receiving their blessed Messiah. He wrote this in Romans 9, 2 and 3. I have great sorrow and increasing anguish in my heart. I wish that I myself were accursed for the sake of my brothers. He wishes he could go to hell if masses of the Jewish people would be converted by the gospel. So he's being very honest about the objective role the Jews played in crucifying the Lord Jesus when he was betrayed in Jerusalem. I was reading in John 19 in my devotions this morning, and this was the passage, and it, it takes your breath away the way Jesus was treated by his own people. It's predicted actually from the beginning of Jesus' life. If you go to Luke chapter 2, and Mary and Joseph appear at the uh, temple to present Jesus, and there's an old man named, there named Simeon, and he prophesies to the parents about the life of Jesus, and among other things, he says this, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and the rising of many in Israel and for a sign to be opposed. And this indeed, in fact, is, appeal, is, uh, is fulfilled. So you step back and you go, does this really make any sense? Man, at one level it doesn't. Jesus Christ is the most beautiful person in the world. Who ever said he could have done it better? Jesus perfectly embodied truth with grace, tenderness with compassion, power with gentleness, Self-sacrifice without failure, weakness without fear. He perfectly embodied strength without bullying, sovereignty without injustice, mercy without sentimentalism, anger without bitterness, tears without hopelessness, intensity without burnout, brightness without blinding. Why is anybody upset? Really, why is anyone upset that Jesus Christ, full of compassion and love and kindness and irrepressible mercy, heals the sick, feeds the hungry, raises the dead, teaches the truth of God, and sets human beings free from demonic oppression? What is wrong with that? It makes no sense. There's nothing to dislike in Jesus and everything to love, and yet Jesus exposes what there is to dislike in ourselves. So disdain for Jesus must be an indicator of the condition of one's heart. So think about it. The humble were drawn to Jesus. They were intoxicated with his glory so that the broken saw wholeness, the sick healing, those in darkness, light, those in lies, the truth, the downcast found a refuge, the shaken, a hope, the hungry satisfaction, those in chains, freedom, sinners, found salvation. So those with nothing who were destitute found in Jesus everything. But the proud, the self-reliant, they were exposed, they were repelled by Jesus. So that if you had any sense of authenticity in the presence of Jesus, you would conclude this, my goodness, 
my sense of moral uprightness pales in comparison to Jesus. So you could put it this way, the living word made flesh, Jesus, the word made flesh does what the written word of God does. What does the written word of God do? It convicts us of sin. It uncovers our pride. It exposes self-righteousness. It exposes darkness in my heart. <laughs> you could put it this way. Being around Jesus was like being around a really hard worker. Other hard workers love her. She makes the team better. She ele elevates everyone else. The other workers love a woman who's going all out after the job. But the lazy workers, oh, they don't like her because she exposes what they really are. Jesus manifests, like no other person in history, a human glory that is infinitely better than anyone else, and yet he was hunted and hated and killed for it. Does that make any sense to you? Let me amplify this a little bit more. You could put it this way, that the presence of Jesus the person of Jesus and the preaching of Jesus created a space, made a distinction between falsehood and truth, between darkness and light, both at an institutional level and for individuals. When you read the Gospels, you see that the presence of Jesus, the person of Jesus, the preaching of Jesus creates this sometimes awkward space between falsehood and truth, both institutionally and for individuals. So how institutionally? Well, Jesus walked into the religious structures of his day and he said, you got it all wrong. He started criticizing. <laughs> yeah, he ignored their man-made rules. He didn't wash his hands when he came from the marketplace. He's like, there's nowhere it says that in the law of God. Heck with you. Jesus showed how they minimized God's laws and laid burdens on people's back they were never meant to carry. Jesus exposed the leaders as arrogant, bigoted, disdaining of the outsider. And he condemned their false trust. He said, just because you have a piece of paper that you can trace your lineage back to Abraham, that doesn't mean you're children of God. You need the reality that the promise made to Abraham, the sign of the promise, the covenant, you need the reality. He dispensed with empty formality. And so, and so it got him killed. What about this space created between falsehood and truth personally, individually? Well, if you spend any time with Jesus, and we have that privilege in the Word of God. Jesus is in all of your Bible. Whenever you're reading your Bible, the prayer should be, Jesus, show me yourself. When anybody spends time with Jesus and they're honest, they begin to conclude things like this, oh my, I'm not the person God created me to be. Oh my. I fall far short of what God has called me to be. Oh, do I love myself more than I love God? Am I more committed to my glory than God's? Do you experience that when you read the Bible? If you don't, you need to pray that the Holy Spirit shows up and ask the Word of God to do in you the work it's supposed to perform. So Jesus exposed hypocrisy. He exposes my self-love. He exposes my self-righteousness. He exposes your false confidences. This is why the Apostle John wrote as he began his gospel, John chapter 1, the light has shone in the darkness, and men love the darkness rather than the light. Do you? The light exposes what the darkness tries to hide. So here's the million dollar question. What would draw you to the light knowing it's going to expose your heart? What would draw you to the light? Only 
the assurance that in coming to that light, you would not be condemned. So Jesus Christ is both the light that exposes your sin, the burning presence of God that shows you your pride, your self-righteousness, your unbelief, what is utterly wretched about you. And Jesus says, even though I have the right and the authority to condemn you, I will not because I'll take the condemnation to your sin. With that assurance of grace, we can come to Jesus. So do you see how this practically plays out in your Bible reading? You should experience regularly this in your Bible reading. <gasps> I am desperately more sinful than I ever imagined. Yet, I am more loved than I ever dreamt possible. On a regular basis, if the Spirit is using the Word to work in you, that's kind of how you should finish your Bible reading. <gasps> oh my gosh, I'm loved. So, beloved, finish this sentence for me as we finish this first point. The Word can't work in you unless you work in the Word. And ladies, we have had for years a ministry annually here to teach you how to work in the Word. It's women in the Word getting with fellow women to study the Word, learn how to study the Word. Oh, my goodness. It's in September, I believe. There are brochures. October, all over the church. Women in the Word, beloved. That's the first point. It's the longest. How does the Word of God work? It provokes the proud. And of course, God's design is what? To drive you to Jesus as the only solution to your pride and sin. Secondly, shorter, the Word of God predicts hostility. I'm jumping into chapter 3, verse 4. For indeed, when we were with you, we kept telling you in advance that we're going to suffer affliction, and so it came to pass, as you know. What is Paul referring to? He's referring to those days you walked into his Bible study. He was teaching you about Jesus, his death, his resurrection, his glory from the Old Testament. He was connecting all those promises and pictures of Jesus in the Old Testament to the facts about what Jesus said and did in Jerusalem. And he said, okay, close your Bibles for a second and look at me. Look at me. Now that Jesus has claimed you, now that you are a new creation in Jesus Christ, now that you have given your life to him, now that he is enthroned as your Lord and you are going to follow him, now that that's happened, you will be persecuted. I promise. He warned them. We, he's reminding them in this verse. We told you in advance. And think about how Jesus did this in John 16. He did the same thing with his disciples, John 16, 1 through 4. Jesus has not been betrayed yet. Jesus tells his disciples in the Upper Room Discourse, I've said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. Predictions of future suffering and persecution function to set your mind right for these things. Jesus said they will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he's doing service to God. They will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me, but I've said these things to you that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. So literally, Jesus expects that as some of these Christians are being martyred, they're recalling the words of this prediction right here. Peter heard those words. Peter would eventually write in 1 Peter chapter 4, Beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come upon you for your testing as though some strange thing is happening. So the whole idea is what? Forewarned is forearmed. That's the idea. It's like when you go to the doctor and the nurse is ready to stick your arm with something or the doctor. 
and they say, okay, this is going to feel like a bee sting. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad to know that. that. That's the point. The Word of God predicts this hostility. And, and, and here's why this is important. Because you will be tempted in almost any form of suffering to ditch God. The tempter is tempting you with that, not God. The tempter will say, why follow a God that allows suffering? Why align with a Savior that all of a sudden you got a target on your back? You're going to be persecuted. Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 3, all who desire to follow Jesus Christ will be persecuted. It, you get a target on your back. And why, why would I want that kind of religion? That doesn't make any sense. That's the tempter tempting you. He will tempt you to give up and find a more comfortable way. Jesus Christ, did he find the comfortable way? Or did he take the absolutely hard road to suffer to get you paradise? Oh, there was nothing comfortable about the earthly ministry of Jesus. Virtually nothing. And he set an example for us to follow in the steps. Christians never have the present in view as their final destination. We could say more about that. Last point. How does the Word of God work? What can you expect it to do? It predicts this hostility. It provokes the proud. And thirdly, it produces treasures of grace. Look, look again at verse 17. But since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly with great desire to see you face to face. This is like somebody writing after a year of a pandemic. I want to see you face to face. Because we wanted to come to you. I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of exhortation before the Lord Jesus is coming? Is it not you? You are our glory and crown. So whoever accused Paul of being a cold, detached theologian had no idea what the man was like. Far, far, far from that is this man. So Paul's alluding to the fact that his detractors have come into the church and pointed to the fact that Paul's friends whisked him away in, at night in Thessalonica. Paul never got to say his goodbyes. He never had a farewell address. He was whisked away at night for his own safety, dashed out of town. The detractors came into the Thessalonian church and said, this guy doesn't love you. Look what he did. He bailed on you. So he assures them of his love. He says, we endeavored the more eagerly to come to you, but Satan thwarted us. So a plot by the evil one seeks to create angst in relationships. Satan hates the unity we have. He hates it. He hates the church. He hates uh, the face-to-face, -face, there's something glorious. And did, did you remember the, um, Ed Barnes in, in the midst of the pandemic did this wonderful little five-minute thing in, on the church webpage about, about what it meant, about missing faces. Do you remember this? Yes, you did it. Did anybody see it? I wasn't living here, but I thought it was just wonderful that there's something special about seeing faces. Satan doesn't want that. He wants to divide the church. And any issue will do. Any issue will do. So he assures them of his love. Verse 19. Who is our hope or joy or crown of exaltation? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus that is coming? You are our glory and joy. I mean, the way he's speaking, you think he had kids or he's in love? Look, this is not mushy sentimentalism where I love how you love me. No, no. I love how I feel in your presence. No, no, that's not what this is. This is some ability he has to see with spiritual eyes their surpassing value because they belong to Jesus. It's like clothed in the grace of Jesus, they've swallowed these Diamonds and gold and gems that sparkle, and he looks at them and he sees their value because he sees Christ. And so he asks this question Who is our hope or joy or crown of exaltation? Boys and girls, what's the Sunday school answer to that question? The answer is Jesus. 
He's our joy, our hope, our crown of exaltation. True. Let's put it on your test answer. You get the right answer. Wait a minute. Paul says, it's you. Has he become a heretic? Has he said too much about the status of believers? No. Here's why. Because the moment these believers and the moment you are united to Jesus Christ by faith, what is true of Jesus has to be true of you. And so Paul seems to be saying, yes, it's true that Jesus is our joy, our glory, our crown, but if you are united to Jesus in some way, that is also true of you. You share a glory in kind with the Lord Jesus that will become visible when? In the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming. I know it's not evident to you <laughs> that I am your joy, your crown, or, or uh, all that good stuff. It's not evident now because you see too much sin and too much humanity in me. But on that day, we will be glorified with Jesus when he comes. It's just stunning. Our middle son, Luke, is a professional, professional photojournalist. To launch his career, he was uh, awarded an internship with the New York Times in Washington, D.C. Uh, when President Obama was in office. So he spent time on Capitol Hill, the White House, Air Force One, took a lot of important pictures for the Times. And sometimes I get a text, frontin', F-R-O-N-T-N, frontin'. That means I'm on the front page of the New York Times dad above the fold, go to Starbucks and buy the paper, <laughs> which I was all too happy to do. Go in the door, go over to the newsstand, New York Times, pick it up, look photo credit, Luke Sharon. <gasps> Above the fold. That's the cat's meow of a journalist, photojournalist. I take it over to the cashier, lay it down, and it would say just loud enough for everyone in Starbucks to hear, my son did that. It's pathetic to think of it now. It just really is. My son did that when Jesus Christ, the Son of God, comes in glory. And you are glorified with him. His Father will declare for all the universes to hear, my son did that. My son went to earth in humiliation to die on the cross, the death their sins deserve. My son has clothed them in his beautiful righteousness. My son has washed them in his precious blood. My son has drawn them to himself. My son ever lives to pray for them. My son did that. Oh my goodness, what a day. Paul's version of that in Ephesians 2.10, so that in the ages to come, God might show the surpassing greatness of his kindness towards us in Christ. In other words, if you know Jesus, you are a trophy of his grace, and on that day, Jesus will be, as it were, lifting up his trophies, kissing them. I did this. That's you. That's where... We're going, beloved. That transforms everything you do this afternoon and this week. And that will give you a hunger for the word of promise, the word that reveals Jesus, to give you unspeakable joy and confidence and humility and zeal and love for him. Let's pray. We are, in fact, infinitely more glorious in your sight, our God, than we know. One with Christ. 
your joy, your crown, your boasting. It's stunning. So turn our eyes afresh and anew to this Christ to see him as lover of our souls, possessor of our lives, the word made flesh whose word we long to be in us, working in us, transforming us, convicting us, comforting us, assuring us that if God is for us, who could be against us? Pray in Jesus' name. Amen.